Okay, you'll remember last time we analyzed the syllogism and we ended up with this. No ARS, all ARP, and no PRS. And we determined that it was in standard form, and at that point I determined that we were done. Uh, well, it turns out there was one more step, and rather than append it onto the last recording, I thought I would just um, add it to this recording. So, we look at the syllogism, now we can analyze it, right? And for me, the easiest thing to do is go through the different rules. And so, in doing so, uh, again, we go through uh, the last three. We don't have a particular conclusion, so it can't be rule five. Um, there is a negative premise and also a negative conclusion, so rule four is okay. And there's an affirmative premise, so we don't have two negative conclusions, so rule three is okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to, actually instead of circling, I am going to use the highlighter and highlight um, all of the distributed terms. Remember in E statements, both are distributed. In A statements, it's the subject. And so here are all the distributed terms. Now, using the different rules, all right, I can determine first, I'm, I'm sorry, we can look at the last two. Um, it's not the fallacy of undistributed middle because both middle terms are distributed actually, so we're fine there. But if we look at what's distributed in the conclusion, notice both terms are distributed in the conclusion. S is also distributed in the premise, and so this is not the fallacy of illicit major. But P is distributed in the conclusion, but not in the premise. Therefore, um, this syllogism, which is um, E, A, E, and it's, it's figure 3, right? Because the position of the middle term is the subject in both. Figure 3, E, A, E, figure 3. Um, and if we look at it, um, I'm sorry. It is E, A, E, figure 3. The slide is wrong. Hopefully, I will have fixed the slide by the time I go over this in class. Um, e, A, E, figure 3. And um, it is invalid, illicit minor. All right. Um, actually, let me just go ahead and change this now on the slide since uh, maybe you fell asleep and uh, um, didn't catch that. So it says 2 on the slide, but in fact, it's a 3. OK, E, A, E, figure 3. Now we're ready to go to the last part which is analyzing ordinary language statements. OK, when we translate ordinary language statements, or arguments, I should say, sorry, not statements, arguments, it's fairly similar to what we've been doing in the past. We're going to, first of all, find the premise and the conclusion. All right? Okay. Find the premises and the conclusion. Then, we're going to start by translating one statement into a categorical statement. Then, we're going to translate another statement using one of the two terms from the st first statement as a term. And we'll go through this process. Finally, we translate the last statement using the two terms that were not in common in the first two statements. And then, we'll put the syllogism into standard form. Can you just wait until we do this? This is going to be fun. Okay. So it's a good idea to have information from 4.7 to review for this part, because remember, 4.7 was teaching us how to turn ordinary language statements into categorical statements. So here is our example. All of the movies, except for chick flicks, were exciting. Hence, the action films were exciting, because none of them are chick flicks. Now, for those of you who don't like the terminology chick flicks, I apologize. I think I took this from one of Hurley's problems. So anyway, let's take a look at this. All right. The conclusion is the action films were exciting, right? Because it's the words after hence. One premise, all of the movies except for chick flicks were exciting. And the other premise is none of them are chick flicks. All right. So let's start. Here's the syllogism. All of the movies except for chick flicks were exciting. None of them are chick flicks. The action films were exciting. 
the first premise could actually be done in two ways, right? Because it's a uh, acceptive proposition. The second premise is a little bit unclear, so we're going to start with the conclusion. The action films were exciting. Okay. What do we say here? Uh, all action films are films that were exciting. So the two terms we have are action films and films that were exciting. Now, let's look at none of them are chick flicks. The two terms we have from the conclusion are action films and films that were exciting. The other pr premise talks about exciting films, so we will be using action films. Also, from the original statement, we know them refers to action films. So, if we say none of them are chick flicks, this would become no action films are chick flicks. All of the movies except for chick flicks were exciting. The terms that we have left that have not been used twice are films that were exciting and chick flicks. So what is this statement saying about the relationship between these two terms? It's basically saying here that no chick flicks are films that were exciting. You could also say uh, no films that were exciting are chick flicks and realize that since conversion works in E statements we know that both of them are the same so it doesn't really matter which one we use. But let's go with this translation for the purpose of uh, exposition. So here's the syllogism. No chick flicks are films that were exciting. No action films are chick flicks. Therefore all action films are films that were exciting. The next thing we ask ourselves is this in standard form? Okay. Um, so we go through this and we see, again, we're going to look and make sure that um, we've got it in terms of major premise, minor premise, and um, conclusion. So we look at the predicate of the conclusion, which is all action films are films that were exciting, which is the major um, term. We look at the first premise and there's the major term there, films that were exciting. So we know that the minor term here is in the second premise here and so we know that the syllogism is in standard form. And it's in standard form and we look at it and it's an EEA and we know that it's invalid. Why do we know that it's invalid? Well, one way we could do is look it up in the text, but the easiest way really is to look at that. We've got EE, -E, we've got two negative um, statements, and um, basically you can't have that, right? Exclusive premises, violation of rule number three, and so it's going to be invalid. And that's the end of this presentation. So now we're done with chapter five, and you should have everything you need to know to do the exam.